the last 72 hours has been absolutely crazy uh, as far as football goes. Uh, Ed Woodward has resigned from Manchester United. The Super League has collapsed. There is huge, intense pressure on the Glazers as owners of Manchester United. But will they sell? Is there any chance that we can push this through and get rid of the Glazers, just like we did with Ed Woodward? I need to... I need to know a bit more about the finances behind everything. Uh, so that's why I'm speaking today. Thank you very much for your time. I'm speaking to Kieran Maguire, uh, author of The Price of Football and a football financial expert, I think it would be fair to call you. No, no, I'm just I'm, I'm just, I'm just a jumped up teacher, according to some. Well, well, jumped up teacher or not, you know a fair bit more about finances. That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the collapse of the European Super League what sort of impact that has on all the clubs involved, the Glazers, the finances, everything in between. But there's, there's only one place we can start, Kieran, and that is with the European Super League. Now, it's collapsed. There were contracts that were signed. As far as you know, what sort of fines could Manchester United expect? How can, this, how can the collapse of the European Super League affect the Glazers financially? Well, um, if Manchester United have signed a contract with the European Super League company, which I understand to be based in Spain, then um, they will have to start the formal exit procedure. And there could be financial penalties for leaving within a fixed period of time. So that that's part of the, I think it's a 177 page document, which nobody's seen, which governs the behavior of all of the founder members. <clears throat> now, it, it appears that it looks like nine clubs or eight or nine clubs have already left, um, but they may have already bought shares in that company and those shares could have cost millions. So there's a story in one of the papers that those shares have cost each club eight million pounds, effectively as a deposit. Um, those shares are presently worthless because there is no Super League. And, and first of all, I, I don't think we should be calling it a Super League. It, it involves three countries and seven cities. That, that's not super to me. That's not super to you. I don't think that's super to, to, to other United fans. So um, the, the, I think the, the, the Manchester United potentially could have ended up with shares which are worthless. So that's going to hit them a little bit in the pocket. Um, the other issue is... Are they going to be fined and will they have to pay JP Morgan, Clifford Chance, who I believe are the lawyers behind this? Well, well, they will. You know, these people are professional service companies. They will have done due diligence in terms of setting up the, 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 uh, the business. Um, they'd employed a spin doctor to, to run the, the marketing campaign for them. They will have had accountants in to, uh, you know, set up sort of the governance issues so that there will be lots of costs which have been incurred, which the people behind the franchise organisation were hoping to recoup and more through the sale of TV rights and it being a popular competition, not with legacy fans, as you are now known, by the way. You know, if, if, you're, if you're a regular Red, if you've been following United all your life, or you've been going to the Stretford End you know, since your dad first went there, um, you are not the people that the franchise league wants. And, and they made that very clear. They want the game to appeal to new people, uh, people with more disposable income, people who are more likely that when they turn up at Old Trafford are going to spend money in the megastore. So um, that's, that's where we are. It, it could be costly, are we talking hundreds of millions of pounds? I think it highly unlikely. Um, could we be talking tens? I, I think that's that's very possible. Now, <clears throat> for me as a fan looking at this, uh, I, I've seen what the Glazers have done. They've stripped United of so much money since they bought us on a leveraged buyout back in 2005. For me, it's obvious this was a key part of their business plan. The idea of going into the Super League, increasing the value of Manchester United even more, and that was going to be their exit. They were going to sell at that point. But that's not, well, right now it's not happening at the moment. Florentino you know, Perez did an interview last night. He's still convinced that Super League will happen. And I hope he's just wrong. But if it's not going to be the Super League as the exit plan for the Glazers, what do you think changes in their business model from now on if they're going to try and hold on to Manchester United? 
Well, the Glazer family have felt for some time that United have a vast global fan base that the club, and again, I'm using their language, not mine, that the club is not monetizing. If we take Manchester United's 2019 account, so you know, let, let's ignore the impact of COVID. Let, let's think about normal year. Manchester United had revenues of £627 million, but they claim to have 1.1 billion fans. So Manchester United are generating 57 pence per fan per year. And that's rubbish. So the Glazers' fervent belief is if we could get a pound a fan or even yeah let's say, let's say if we can get two pounds per fan per year manchester united goes from a club which is generating 600 million pounds a year to a club which is generating over two billion pounds a year and all of a sudden that has a huge impact upon the stock market so th that was their exit route to, to take united up to the new level to to work out how to extract money from more and more fans at, at a higher level and then the stock market share price would go up and they could either start to sell the shares off on, on small batches or it could be that somebody comes in, a tech giant, a media giant, because you know, in order to monetize these fans, I think you'd, you'd have to use uh, new media, new technologies. And Manchester United would be quite an attractive product because they've been now freed from... The, the Premier League TV rights deal. They can sell their own rights to fans. Under the proposals for the Champions League, Manchester United would have been allowed to sell three home matches a season direct to fans. And, and this is where the money is. There's no doubt about that. So from a business perspective, that opportunity would now appear to be dead. So if I was the Glazers, I'd be thinking, where is this future growth going to come from? And have we actually reached to a certain extent peak Manchester United in terms of value in for the next decade or so? Yeah, we, the one thing we know about the future is we don't know anything about the future. And you know, clearly the events of the last 72 hours, there can be lots of surprises. But it's difficult to see at present how the proposals of the Franchise League can really manifest themselves again. Uh, well, I hope you're right about that. The, the, it strikes me as unless the ownership structure inside Britain changes uh, away from the idea that uh, an investor can come in and own more than 50% of the clubs, obviously the 50 plus one is really being talked about. I'm going to be having a chat with a couple of uh, guys from Germany today, hopefully to find out a bit more about that. But in, in, in the short term, look, let's, let's uh, well, you can't really ignore the, events of the last 72 hours but what do you expect to happen inside the football market this summer uh because transfers are always a big thing for all teams and because of what's happened with covid and what's happened with the with the european super league on top of that uh, do you expect clubs to be busy or quiet this summer or will it with either of those really affect it I think what we will see is different tiers in the market. And there's always different, you know, we're, we're always operating on different levels, but that will really will be amplified this summer. There will be the elite clubs, but there's fewer of them because Real Madrid and Barcelona on the collapse of this, they got nowhere to go. They, they, they really, you know, I think they will be struggling to, to sign the nine figure uh, deal players. Um, but Manchester United is an elite club. And who are they competing with? Realistically, they're normally competing with Real Madrid, Barcelona, uh, PSG, City. Bayern don't tend to come in at that higher level. You know, Bayern, I think, have actually ever got quite modest uh, approach to the, the, the market in terms of the, the uber, uber players. So I think two of those players are potentially out of the market on the collapse of Super League. So that should result in a softening of prices. And certainly as we drop down the Premier League and once you go into, go, go into the EFL, there's very little ability to spend money unless you've got a lot of players out of contract. Palace have got 12 players out of contract this summer, for example, or you operate a sell-to-buy approach. Um, so, you know, if... Uh, 
if, if Palace sell Zaha to Arsenal or Spurs, then they would, they'd reinvest that. I think they would. If Grealish sells, sorry, if, if Villa sold Grealish to City or United, you, I think Villa can go back into the market. Villa, to be fair, do have rich owners who who are that they're actually one of the sides that can spend reasonable by by Premier League standards. As far as United are concerned, I, I think it will be same as before. Yeah, they they won't be spending vast amounts, but I think they can still be very competitive in this summer's market. Well, I, I, I suppose at this point, transfers are it's become irrelevant really that that's how big the news has been in the last 72 hours but from a financial perspective what do you think is the conversations that are going on between the glazers at the moment what's going to be their immediate reaction to all of this obviously joel glazers come out with a groveling crap apology just like john henry has and the fans aren't swallowing any of it so the discontent towards the owners they're effectively national hate figures now because we've been saying for years and years how bad the Glazers are. And all of a sudden, Ed Woodward and Joel Glazer are two of the architects behind something that literally is designed to kill football as we know it. And United fans want to try and use that momentum. Now, obviously, we can, we can protest, we can do what we want, but from a financial perspective, and that is the crucial thing because the Glazers are just money-driven people. What is the situation now at United? What are the fun... Uh, do you feel that the Glazers, do you, because of everything that's happened with COVID, now that the European Super League has collapsed, do you think that they will be having conversations about selling? Well, there, there's more than one Glazer child who has shares in Manchester United. Some of the children are invested in the club. Uh, Joel Glazer is the driver. There's no doubt about that. Some of the others... They're just along for the ride. So um, I, I don't think they're actually bothered about the protests. I mean, as as for the apologies, those apologies were actually put together by the media department at the clubs. You know, they, they were they were drafted. John, John Henry and Joel Glazer had nothing to do with those. They just signed off on them. It, it was effectively um, try to take some of the heat away from other people at the club. Um Given that the Super League project at present is a is a non-starter, it could it could easily start up again in five years. Um, I think there's a case for saying: Is there any opportunity for significant growth of Manchester United revenues from elsewhere? And if you take a look at a football club, where does it get money from? Ticket sales, TV, and commercial deals well they, they've signed up the the commercial deal with team viewer they've got a lot they're in a long-term uh kit manufacturing deal with adidas so so those deals are sealed off so we're talking smaller deals not really going to generate a lot more money for the club broadcasting it looks like we're locked in we, we've have we reached peak uh have we reached peak tv revenues probably have domestically because mainly due to the fact that Sky and BT are no longer fighting each other. Um, and therefore, can we increase ticket revenues? I, I don't think it would be a good idea for them to put up ticket prices, given what fans have just been through for a year. You know, many fans have lost their jobs. Many fans have been on furlough. Um, and I, I try to be as objective as I can they could have put up season ticket prices a lot more over the last decade and they they didn't now admittedly you know price as we all know prices went up in the first few years of the glazer ownership pretty obscene and then it's been it's been plateauing for most of the last decade so there's there's little opportunity there's little room for them to increase the money coming into the club that's reflected in the share price. We, we saw on Monday when the deal was first announced, the value of the shares went up by $250 million. And then as it collapsed on Tuesday, it went down just as quickly. Um, so if I, if I was one of the Glazer kids, I know that I'm this hated figure. I think that they, they would be more inclined to sell the shares than they were this time last week. Because this time last week, they were all, you know, 
phoning each other or on their WhatsApp and Zoom groups in the family, rubbing their hands with glee, thinking that Manchester United, which is presently worth around about two and a half billion dollars on the New York Stock Exchange, could easily be worth four or five billion if the um, if the Super League project uh, went through and if the, the the claims of money that could be made off it actually turn out to be realistic. And, and again, we, we, that's conjecture. We, we don't know who the deals are with. Um, we don't know whether fans would sign up. And, and, I, and I suspect many United fans wouldn't sign up for that project because they were conceptually opposed to it. But that would be the hardcore United fans. That would be what uh, Ramon Perez refers to as legacy fans, i.e. people who fell in love with Manchester United at the age of seven or eight, have stood on the Stratford end, go to a match, probably turn up at 10 to three and leave at five o'clock because you know we, we all know that the facilities are really poor on Old Trafford. Whereas the tourists you know, turn up early, they eat the overpriced food and drink, they spend a fortune in the megastore. What, what Perez has been talking about is actually replacing the hardcore fans with this new breed of uh, fan with who is more financial uh, facilities on a match by match basis. They can they, you can scalp them for higher ticket prices and things of that nature. So that opportunity to a certain extent has gone. Therefore, that gives us limited room to increase the share price from through developing the club and why keep the shares you know they already own the shares they can sell the shares for you know, whatever it is is it 16 17 dollars at present um and bank the money put the money into other projects and see how they get on with those okay so uh, my final question leading on from all of that is what do you think could change in the next say month two three months that really will force the hands of the glazers is it simply the valley of united collapsing is it more likely to be legislation from the government what do you think is really going to be the driver for united if we are able to get glazers out of our club which is everything that all fans want well all united fans anyway i i, no, I, I think speaking as fans of other clubs they, they want them out as well because yeah, nobody has any time. I, I teach at the University of Liverpool that their view of the Glazers is the same as their view of John Henry at present. You know, they, they see them as pariahs of the game, as people that don't understand the the history and the heritage and the culture of, of European football and, and you know, get out of our game and get out of our club is 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 without doubt the, the universal approach. Um I'm I'm not convinced that there's a lot that will happen that is probably well, certainly nothing that's going to force their hand the government is in is in is not in a position where it can do very much because ultimately manchester united is as a result of ed woodward it is now registered in the cayman islands and it trades in new york so the, the uk government has very little power over the um governance of a company which is not based um, in the UK, all it can do is sort of guerrilla, guerrilla disruption by saying that unless, for example, on a board of directors, let's say you've got seven seven directors on a board, unless fans are allowed to appoint three of those directors, then the government will not allow Matt will not give safety certificates to clubs unless they've got fan representation. And that won't force the Glazers out. It will simply allow other people to have a bigger voice in terms of uh, observing the decision making process which is taking place at the club and holding the likes of Ed Woodward. And, and Ed Woodward is not a football fan. Ed Woodward is a chartered accountant and an investment banker. And he's a very good chartered accountant and an investment banker which possibly means why he's not necessarily the greatest person to run Manchester United from a football perspective but he's he's delivered for the Glazers as far as they're concerned Joel Glazer thinks the world of him so I, I, I don't think forcing them out is it has moved significantly forwards um, I think it would have to come from them we've already established since 2005 that they've got brass necks. They, they don't turn up to matches. 
you know, because they know that they'd potentially be run out of town. Um, and, um, you know, that, that's where we stand at present. So could there be changes? Could there be better representation and the voice of the fans uh, heard at board level? I think there is the possibility of that. The Glazers leaving... I think you know Joel Glazer's probably too stubborn because you know the the idea of being kicked out of of a company that he owns won't sit, sit fit it won't won't fit well with him. You know, but billionaires don't have you know a sense of humility, and and they and he would find this you know quite embarrassing. So I suspect you'll probably sit tight. I do suspect you're right, but this obviously we've had our protest back in 2004 when we opposed the actual ownership takeover we've had our protest back in 2010 when it you know it got the green and gold campaign really came strong but this now feels i don't know it, it feels bigger it feels like if there's an opportunity for united and the fact that ed woodward has resigned over this it shows it's bigger so i think that's what united fans are holding on to obviously you're you're a teacher inside Liverpool and they're going to feel the exact same towards FSG in the same way that Arsenal fans towards Stan Kroenke and it really is is that what they tried to do was establish the American franchise business model on British football and there was so much fan power that it it forced it to collapse and 48 hours ago if you had asked any fans they probably would have disagreed that we had that sort of power but we've proven that we do so fingers crossed that anything we can do to push the Glazers closer towards the exit door, we will continue to do. I really appreciate your time today, Kieran. Uh, it's really interesting to hear it from a financial perspective, uh, from a legal perspective. The point you made there about being registered in the Cayman Islands and trading on the New York Stock Exchange really, I suppose, does complicate things when it comes to legislation in the government. But uh, I really appreciate your time today. As I said, uh, hopefully we can have another chat at some point in the future. Uh, but fingers crossed, uh, something does change, eh? Because it needs it. British football needs it. Yeah, it, it, it's called the people's game for a reason, and it's not the billionaires' game. And that's 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 how we've all grown up. Perhaps that's too romantic a notion. And you know, has the game actually gone? Is it now just the plaything of others? But that's not why I fell in love with my club, and you fell in love with Manchester United. No, it absolutely isn't. And I, I hope for all of our sakes that we can. We've won the battle, but can we win the war? That's the thing that we're going to see over the next few months, I suppose. But I uh, really appreciate your time today and good luck with your next interview. <laughs> Thanks very much. Cheers.